Hello to our friends joining us via recording. It is January 21st and we are working on learning about the difference between anatomy and physiology. Before we dive in to our silly examples that we started with in our group work, I have a question for my friends who are here in class today. Does anyone remember from the very beginning of class I told you one of my students last semester came up with a great description of what anatomy is. What did we say anatomy is? Or how would you describe what anatomy is? Yeah, so the, the phrase that I used at, at the very beginning of our live session, we talked about anatomy is where it's at. Or, or I like what a couple of us are saying in the chat. They're saying it, it's the what. What's there? Where do I find it? Uh, all those kind of things that are just basic structure type questions, basically. That's anatomy. When we think about anatomy, which is the first half of the name of our course, most of the anatomy studying, the where it's at, what it looks like, those kind of structure things, that's primarily going to be lab. So we're gonna spend lab time learning to identify structures to figure out where they are. You saw that in the first lab packet that we did together. We were learning about organs, where the organs are found or where the bones are found. All of that kind of stuff is anatomy. Now, when we switch down to this word physiology, how might we describe what physiology is? Physiology is, is not the same as anatomy. It's the other half of, of our course. Yeah, so, so physiology, if we want a quasi rhyming word for us or what starts with the same sound, physiology is the function. It's what something does. It, it's purpose or, or I like how someone was saying it's the why or the how. Why do we have this structure? What is it doing in the body? How does it do that? That's perfect. So when, uh, when you're thinking about the two topics that we're covering in our semester, anatomy, what's there or where it's at, physiology, the function, what it's doing. Hopefully we've had a chance to look over lesson number one for lecture a little bit because my question here comes from uh, that lesson. When we talk about anatomy and physiology, here, here's my question, and it's a true or false question. True or false, anatomy and physiology are related to each other. Anatomy and physiology are related. What do we think? Yeah, my chat is blowing up with all kinds of truths. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The way that you would hear it described, or you see it, it, it in that guided lesson is that they depend on each other. If I'm trying to figure out what something does, I can look at what's there to help me do that. Anatomy and physiology, what's there and what it does. But just like I can use this idea of what's there to figure out what it does, I can actually go the opposite way too. So if I know what something needs to do, if I know it's physiology, that can help me predict what needs to be there, what its job is. So anatomy, the way the lesson phrases it, anatomy dictates physio physiology. What's there is gonna tell me what it can do. But physiology also dictates anatomy. What it's doing also tells me what I need to have there. So it's kind of like we got that chicken and egg question, right? Do, does the anatomy come first and tell me what I can do? Or does what I need to do tell me what needs to be there? Who knows? We could, could debate that forever and never have a good answer. But the big idea of this lesson, keep in mind, if you know something's structure, you can make some predictions about what it does. Or if you know what it does, you can make some predictions about its structure, what it looks like, anatomy and physiology. Now in our groups, we worked with some examples that are not strictly related to the human body. Actually, they're not related to the human body at all, right? <laughs> 
the, the first set of examples of things, the, one of the things that we worked with in our groups to compare and contrast, over here on the left, we see a regular sponge like you might have in your kitchen. Over here on the right, we have what's called a Brillo pad or, or steel wool. When we are, are talking about the anatomy of these structures, this is going to be a description of what's there or what they look like. So let's start with our sponge over here on the left. In the chat, tell me some of the things that you and your group came up with that represent the anatomy of this sponge. What are some of the descriptions of what it looks like? or what it feels like. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm loving, loving the word squishy. That is perfect. A sponge is very squishy. That's perfect. It's got lots of holes in it. Absolutely. We'll, we'll go technical, right? One of my friends said that it's porous, meaning it has holes. Um, let's see. It, yeah, it's absorbent. So we, it can, can hold water. Or it can hold soap. Love it. Okay. So it's absorbent, it can, can hold things. Okay, this is, is a sponge, something that, that we wouldn't have problems probably grabbing and squeezing. Speaking from personal experience, it's not so fun to kind of grab and squeeze these things over here. Steel wool, not so great for that. What were some of the things that you and your group came up with related to this steel wool, the anatomy? of our steel wool. I know some of us said too that we had no experience with it. You're, you're lucky if you haven't had to use Brillo pads before. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about how these things are made out of metal. Um, definitely an anatomy, a what's there. These are our metal pads. They've got this blue soap that's on them. They are, are very scratchy and rough, absolutely scratchy and rough. Uh, that's why I mentioned you probably don't want to squeeze these things. That's going to be painful for you. So um, when we when we talk about the anatomy of a Brillo pad, very different. What's there is very different. It's made out of metal. It's really scratchy. When we talk about a sponge, this is something that's going to be really squishy. It's going to have little holes in it. That's perfect. When we move down here to the physiology the what I'd use these things for, I actually want to start over here with, with my Brillo pad. For my friends who've used a Brillo pad before, why would you use this? What in particular does steel wool help us with? Or, or what makes you pull it out? Yeah, when we need to we need to remove something that's baked on, right? Or something that's like really hard. Oh yeah, the stove top too. Yeah, 100%. If there's something that's like really stuck, these the steel wool is really good at that. So when I'm thinking about the physiology of steel wool, it's going to get stuck stuff off. It's going to pull stuff off. Yeah, we're, we're listing all the, the various places that we could use it on, right? Basically anywhere where there's something baked on or really hard stuck on. Um, yeah, because it's metal, we could even like smooth stuff out with it. Brillo pads are very powerful. Don't uh, don't use them if you have a really nice pan. Don't use them really hard on there because you will scratch up your pan. I may or may not, again, be speaking from personal experience on that one. <laughs> yeah, gloves are super helpful. Yeah, because it, it they can get little little stuff into your hands. That's not fun either. <laughs> when we think about the physiology, what we might use a sponge for. What are some of the things that we might use a sponge for? I saw a fun one in the chat earlier too. What are, what's the physiology of a sponge? Yeah, so if we're just doing kind of some basic washing dishes, right? If there's, it's not stuck on food yet, it's, it's just, you know, we just finished eating and we're doing the dishes. A sponge would help us with that. Yeah, so, so Chris is chiming in with a thing that, that I liked from earlier. You could totally use a sponge for a bath. So I'm going to say a human bath. We've got a, a dish bath, right? Um, or you could do a human bath with it. So something that's maybe not quite as um, stuck on 
or maybe something, some kind of bath that we don't, we want to make sure we don't scratch stuff up. A sponge is going to be a lot better for that. Yeah. So a sponge, I, I like that. Um, a word that came up in the chat, a sponge is more gentle. Absolutely. So if I want to clean something gently, my sponge is the way to go. If I want to make sure I clean something, so I'm going to say, I'm going to add deep clean over here to my Brillo pad. If, if I'm trying to do a deep clean, I'm fighting really hard to get something off. A Brillo pad would help with that. If I'm trying to do a more gentle clean, a sponge would be the way to go. So yeah, like, like somebody mentioned in the chat, let's only use sponges on our children, not Brillo pads. That would, would not be great. Um, and uh, let's save these Brillo pads for the things we got a really deep clean that that we're willing to scratch up a little bit. So first example, anatomy versus physiology. These two things I can use to clean stuff. Another example that we did with our groups of anatomy versus physiology. Over here on the left, I have an inner tube. Over here on the right, I have an anchor. When we talk about these two things, these are both things that could be used in the water, but they're made out of very different things, which makes them do very different jobs. Let's start with the physiology. Let's start off with the jobs of these structures. When I talk about an anchor, what are some of the things that you and your group said might be the physiology or the job of an anchor? What are the some things that we'd use an anchor for? I totally, uh, the first thing I saw was the, the comment left over from before, wipe countertops. I was like, hmm, <laughs> we're, we're using those anchors for interesting things. <laughs> yeah, so so a few of us are chiming in here. Some of the things that, that we say about anchors, most basic idea about an anchor that's totally right is that anchors sink. Anchors go down to the bottom, right? That's going to be in comparison to when we're talking about our inner tubes, right? When we talk about inner tubes, I'm just going to add this right now since we're talking about it. Inner tubes float. That's what they do. They float compared to anchors that are, are sinking. So when we talk about something that sinks, uh, just like I, I'm seeing some things in the chat here, we're, we're weighing things down or we're holding things in place. So an anchor sinks and it prevents things from floating away. We'll, we'll kind of summarize it like that. So it keeps your little rowboat in place, keeps your cruise ship in place, whatever it might be. An anchor sinks. It's really heavy, so it helps us to hold things in place. By the way, when I say an anchor is heavy, that would be something I could put up here with my anatomy. An anchor being heavy, that's a description of what's there or what it's like. I know I saw this in a, in a couple of my groups too. An anchor is made out of something that makes it heavy. Did we chat in our groups about what I use to make an anchor? What's it made out of? Yeah, so, so anchors are made out of some kind of metal. Could be iron, could be, I don't even know what else, steel. Yeah, some kind of heavy metal. When I make a, a, a thing that's made out of a heavy metal, it's so heavy that it's not going to float on the water. It's going to sink to the bottom. When I talk about an inner tube over here, I think we can all agree inner tubes are not made out of metal. What are inner tubes filled with? What do we have inside that inner tube? Yeah, so inner tubes are filled with air. Let's be real. They're, they're filled with, with mom and dad's exhaled air, right? Speaking as a parent, I, I have and will continue for many years to, to put my air into inner tubes. So we're, we're filled with air in the middle. Um, when we talk about an inner tube, is this something that is heavy or light? Yeah, this is going to be super light, right? So this is going to be light. It's going to be easy to carry, 
even my my little four year old, she could carry around an inner tube. Now she'd probably complain because it's really big, so she wouldn't want to carry it, but she could. She would not be able to carry an anchor. That's going to be way too heavy. So we already talked a little bit about about the physiology here of an inner tube, but because an inner tube is filled with air, or thank you to my friend who who gave us our, our technical um, chemistry name for what it's filled with, with carbon dioxide, right? What you breathe out. Because we're filled with carbon dioxide, we're gonna float. Carbon dioxide or air is lighter than water, so air floats, thereby letting you float. Compared to metal, which is much heavier than water, meaning that an anchor made out of metal is going to sink. Now, we this time kind of started with the function and used that to help us understand what was there. But notice how with this side, we kind of went the other way. We talked about what was there, how it's really light, how we've got carbon dioxide to help us remember that this is something that would float. Anatomy, we can use to predict physiology or we can use physiology to predict anatomy. One last example, my favorite example on a rainy day like today, we got some hiking boots and we got some cozy slippers over here. On a day like today, I want my feet to be uh, wrapped in softness. I want them to be relaxing. Which of these kinds of, of shoes would I be most likely to be wearing today? Like we talked about earlier, I'm not wearing it, alas, but yeah, some kind of, of slippers, right? Fluffy slippers, house shoes, something like that. When we're talking about a type of shoe that here, I'm, I'm going to give a silly description here. When I want some cozy comfort, we'll say, I'm definitely going to reach for, for my slippers for that. Now, if I were on a hike, I um, actually am originally from Colorado, so I love me some mountain hikes. If I was on a hike, cozy comfort is not what I need at that point. If I'm on a hike, I'm going to need something like um, ankle support. Just be real. I twist my ankles way too much. Yeah, I'm going to need some traction um, so I don't slide all around. Hey, if I am, am doing a hike in the mountains, there's a pretty good chance, yeah, at some point I'm going to cross a little stream or have to walk through a, a, a puddle. So I'm going to want it to be waterproof. All of these are, are the kinds of things that a hiking boot could help me with that a slipper's not going to be so great for. But let's be real. When we're talking about cozy comfort, I have yet, I mean, I haven't spent enough money on hiking boots for this, but I have yet to have a pair of hiking boots that are cozy comfort, just being real. <laughs> if, if you hike long enough, pretty much all of, of your hiking boots are going to give you some kind of blister. So we, we've got lots of other great things, not so much the comfort, but hey, you're, you're not going to fall over and you're not going to twist your ankle. Because when we talk about a hiking boot, we have things like laces. Somebody mentioned how I've got laces on here. When we talk about hiking boots, these are going to be made from things like leather or really thick fabric. Uh, they're going to have a really thick sole, probably made out of, of good quality rubber that's, that's not going to let you slip. When we talk about our slippers, if all I'm going for here is cozy comfort, this is going to ma be made out of really soft fabric. My anatomy is going to be soft fabric. It's going to be lined and be really nice. Yeah, it could be fur. Um, there's probably going to be some cushioning in there. We can all dream about really nice slippers. Th the kinds of things that I use to make a slipper are very different than the kinds of things I use to make a hiking boot. Because they're made out of different things, they are better at doing different things. So in a few weeks in lab, we are going to be talking about the different kinds of tissue in your body. Some of the tissues in your body have a whole bunch of proteins. That's going to make them really strong. Some of the tissues in your body uh, have a little bit more squishy stuff 
in them. So when we talk about cartilage, for example, there's like some squishy stuff around your cells. That makes them better at uh, absorbing shock, for example. Bone tissue has proteins that make it strong and it basically has like cement, has the hardest substances in the body. Anatomy dictates physiology. What I have somewhere is gonna determine how it acts or what it does. So keep that in mind throughout this entire semester. I promise you as we do classes together for the rest of the semester, I am always gonna come back to this question. I'm gonna ask you, anatomy and physiology, they are or they are not related to each other. Anatomy and physiology, they are or are not related. What have we learned from our activity? These two things are or are not related. Good. About half of us have picked up on that they are, right? Some of us are shy. That's totally okay. <laughs> so big idea that I hope we take away from class today. Anatomy and physiology definitely are related. And I want you to try to spend this whole semester looking for ways that you can relate what's there to what it does. Hey, as a sidebar, I, I kind of said this before, when we talk about anatomy, this is something that we're going to do a lot of in lab. So identifying things on models, identifying things in visible body, anatomy is the what's there. Physiology is most of what we do in lecture. And I'm gonna, gonna tell it to you straight here. Students don't like studying physiology as much as they like studying anatomy. Because anatomy, we can just memorize. We can look at a picture and we can label that picture. All we gotta do is memorize where stuff's at. When we start talking about physiology, physiology is what it does or how it works. Remember from those learning objectives that we looked at on day one, where I showed you how, how to interpret learning objectives? Physiology is gonna be a lot of those describe learning objectives or those explain learning objectives, where you have to tell me how something works or, or what's going on with it. You'll see with physiology, we will spend our class time talking about the way something normally works. And then on the assignments or often on the tests, I'm going to tell you something went wrong with the physiology. And you'll have to make a prediction of what's going to happen in the body. So here's my, my blanket statement as we start studying this stuff. The way that you study anatomy, which is a, a memorized science, is different from the way that you study physiology, which is an apply science. Make sure that we're, we're not trying to just memorize our way through lecture. You can memorize your way through lab 100%. You totally can. We cannot just memorize our way through, through lecture, since lecture is a little bit more physiology. Dr. Aulis has talked at you way too much. I need to stop talking for a moment. I would love for you to send me an emoji or send me any questions or thoughts that you have. Let me pause for a moment so you can, can send me some stuff. Emojis, questions, etc. Go ahead, Barbara. I'm sorry, it's easier for me to turn my microphone and I'm getting ready for work. But the way I look at anatomy is like it's the building and the physiology is what makes the building work. Am I looking at that correctly? Yeah, that's a, another great analogy. Yeah, so what what is there in the building and then what that building's job is. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's perfect. Send in my emoji. I don't know how many of you have looked at recordings from last semester. I'll start this semester, um, what I, I did for my students last semester. I am a little bit skilled in drawing penguins. So I'm gonna give you all our penguin 
for the day. He's going to wave at you. So if you remind me at the end of each class, if I haven't drawn you our daily penguin, let me know. There's our, our little penguin. I got some questions uh, last semester about these little things. So I'm drawing for you emperor penguins. These are, are their, little, uh, their little feathers coming out of their head. So here's today's penguin. And if you keep asking me, I'll keep drawing you penguins every day. Uh, I think there might have been somebody else's hand that went up. Uh, if you got your hand up, you're welcome to ask a question. Or it might be on accident. I have a question. This is Yami speaking. Yes, um, go for it. Is our class going to be at one every week? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to be meeting Wednesday and Thursday at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, because um, on Thursday, I do have class at 1230, so I don't know mm -hmm. how I'm going to manage that. Yeah, and that's totally fine. If you're not able to make it to our class, um, I will always post the recordings and you're welcome to, to watch those recordings. So it's not a problem if you're not able to come. Yes, because it's it's chemistry. Remember the other day I was attending two classes at the same time. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So feel free to just go to your chemistry class and you can always watch uh, the recording of this one later. That's totally fine. But it's not going to affect my attendance. Correct. Yeah, I, I am. I'm not going to dock you attendance for that. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So for my friends who have two classes, if you if your other teacher is is a stickler and uh, they they need you there, that's totally fine. Um, I'm, I'm not keeping track of attendance based on you coming here. I highly recommend you come. Um, but if you need to leave, that's totally fine. I, I get that. We have about uh, an hour of time left together to help us use that hour the most wisely i want us to do what we did last time so for my friends who were here yesterday you know about poll everywhere here's what we all need to do it's a new day so we're all going to have to do this again you're going to send me a text message so so pull out your cell phone your text message it's coming to to dr Aulis. my phone number is 37607 so start a text to this, this phone number. The first message you send to that number every day when we start class is KAULIS707. So my phone number, 37607. First message, KAULIS707. Once you've sent that first message, it'll bounce back and say you've joined my poll. Then I want you to send me in a few words the parts of lesson number one that you're most interested in us talking about. I want to make sure that I know the specific parts that we're most interested in. Make sure, yeah, we are activated. So my phone number, 37607. First message, KAULIS707. Once it bounces back and said you're joined, Shoot me a quick message of what we want to make sure we talk about. Um, so Dennis, if it says it can't be blank, it means uh, that what you typed isn't coming through. So maybe try to type it again and try to send it. I know I've still got lots of us trying to send in answers. I'll pull up our cloud. Let's see. Um, so maybe for my friends that it's bouncing back and saying it can't be blank, go ahead and try to send send this. Did you already send in K Aulis 707? Let's make sure, uh, cause so try sending in, okay, so you sent that in. So then try to send your message again. Odd that it's it's given us trouble. If we can't get it to work, it's all right. You can you can put your thing in the chat. If it, if it, so if it keeps telling you that um, it can't be blank, I don't know why it's freaking out on us. 
you can add your topics here to our, our regular chat here and I'll factor those into my to my cloud mentally. Here's what we got going on. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of requests for us to work on the blood vessels. We can absolutely do blood vessels. Okay, so I'm seeing some stuff about those fontanelles, so the joints. Want to talk about the joints, blood vessels. I know I'm seeing some, some remind. I'm wondering if the remind is we want a reminder of when stuff is due. Yep, that word due is coming up. Um, so I'll remind us as it's still shuffling due dates tomorrow. What is due tomorrow is a Friday. So Friday's visible body is always due. There are two assignments in visible body. So please go through and create your, um, your trial account. Or if you took this class last semester and you have a code that you were using last semester, log into your account as usual and you'll join my class. So tomorrow, visible body due by the end of the day, two assignments. Sunday, lots of stuff due. Lab homework assignments in Blackboard and then lesson number one for lecture and the brown fat and white fat assignment. That is what is, is due uh, the, in the upcoming days. Please check out that um, assignment checklist as well to help you know what all is, is due when. All right, we're going to focus on the blood vessels. We'll talk about the joints and I, I've got some questions in here about that, that brown fat, white fat assignment. So we'll see what all we can get through. We still got an hour. I bet we can cover most of this stuff here in, in the time that we have together. Get my mouse back. Let's jump back in here. All right. So the first example in your outline is the example with the joints. So we'll go ahead and start with, with the joints. Can you help me out in the chat? Is, is this page one of the, the lesson outline or is this page two? I can't remember which page. Okay, so we're on page two, perfect, okay. So on page two of the lesson number one lecture outline, we are getting to know several of the types of joints that we have in the body. So the first type of joint that we have in the body that's something we're going to see a lot of, we're going to learn about in lab, are a type of joints called sutures. I'm going to type this in the middle, sutures. When we talk about sutures, these are the kind of joints that we find in between many of the skull bones. So when you're looking at this side view of the skull, and hey, remember in lab this week, we're learning the name of each of these bones. So you could use this picture to, to study for lab too. In lecture, we're talking about the things called sutures. Sutures are what we see right here, for example. Or we've got another one that we see right here. And I got another one here in the back. Sutures are the locations where bones in the skull connect with each other. And if I zoomed in really close on these connection points in the skull, this is what I would see. So this is where skull bones come together. Notice how in between these skull bones, there's the, these little white lines. These little white lines are kind of like spider webs. These are made out of collagen. At a suture joint, I've got bones that are basically overlapping with each other and holding them together in those places is collagen or thick, dense proteins that are holding things together. Now, let me briefly turn my camera on. I know it's going to be super small in the left side of your screen, but I want to show you the way that I like to think about how the structure of, of a suture should be coming up shortly. Okay. When you're thinking about the structure of a suture, if you take one hand and then you take the other hand and you overlap them together like this, 
this is what a suture looks like. So one of my bones with its little branches comes together with another bone with its branches. By having these bones that overlap and they're really tight and connected to each other, do we see a lot or a little bit of movement at a suture? How much do, do these kinds of joints that overlap like this, do they move a lot or a little? Yeah, so these kind of joints like I see here, these are only moving a little bit. Sutures are, are sometimes called a non-moving joint. So when you're thinking about a suture, specifically when we're thinking about their physiology, little movement or even no movement. Suture bones, not moving. Uh, when we talk about, about their anatomy, we've got overlapping bones. We've got that uh, proteins that hold the bones together. I had seen a question in the chat if, if collagen and, and cartilage is the same. Uh, it is not. Cartilage has some other stuff inside it as well. So cartilage has some squishy stuff mixed in with that collagen. So they're not exactly the same thing. They're a little bit different. When we talk about these, these joints that don't move very much, we find them between the bones of the skull. Help me out in the chat. Why is it a good thing that the bones of your skull don't move very much? Why is, is this anatomy and, and this physiology here where we don't move a lot? Why is it good that our skull bones aren't, aren't sliding all over the place? Yeah, so, so it's all about protection, right? It's all about protection. And in particular, we are protecting arguably the most important organ in your body. We are protecting the brain. You don't want the bones that, that are wrapped around your brain to move all over the place, to move in and out, because if they move too far in, they could damage our brain, and that, that's bad news. So when we think about the skull, and we think about the way that we connect all of these skull bones to each other, we're using a type of joint called sutures, because sutures don't move very much. They're connected together really tightly. Let's compare sutures to a type of joint that we call synovial joints, synovial joints. The big thing for you to remember with synovial joints is that synovial joints have synovial fluid or these types of bones aren't actually directly connected to each other there's a fluid filled space in between them. Yeah, so Caitlin mentioned in the chat a couple of places where, where we see these kinds of joints. We have them in the hips, we got them in the knees. Hey, we've got them in between each of your phalanges, in between each of the bones of your fingers. So your knuckle joints, those are all synovial joints as well. And now we've all got that urge to pop our knuckles, right? I get this question every semester, so I will answer it for you now. When you pop your joints, and any of your synovial joints can pop, when you pop a joint, what's happening is there were little air bubbles inside this fluid, literally bubbles. So you hear that popping sound when you pop the bubble that's inside the, the fluid inside here. The corollary question I always get asked about synovial joints is, is it okay to pop them? Um, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I've read, as long as it doesn't hurt when you pop them, you should be good. So now that we're all popping our, our joints, right, popping our knuckles, <laughs> what we're doing is getting rid of any air that was inside this fluid filled space in a synovial joint. So when we're talking about synovial joints over here on the anatomy, we're going to mention that we have synovial fluid. We could mention that these bones don't actually touch. They're not actually touching each other. When you think about synovial joints, what are some of the things you all would mention for their physiology? 
why is it good that we have some places in the body with synovial joints? What do they help us to do? Yeah, so I've, I've got some some notes here in my chat. Uh, the big thing with synovial joints is they, they help us with movement, right? Help us to do a lot of, of different kinds of movements. So that's grabbing things, that's letting things go, that is being flexible, the, the ability to bend things forward and backwards. Absolutely. We can do a lot of different movements at joints that are synovial joints. And the reason we can do these different movements is because there's fluid that's in between the bones. There's space for these bones to move past each other. So let's consider a part of the body that we didn't specifically talk about today. Let's consider your ankle joint. Do you think that your ankle joint is more likely to have a suture or a synovial joint? Do you think we'd be more likely to find a suture or a synovial joint in your ankle? Yeah, so lots of us are predicting in the chat, and we're totally correct, your ankle does have synovial joints in it. Now check this out. You all thought about how your ankle joint can move. You thought of the physiology of that joint, and you used it to predict the anatomy. So we're already doing good with this whole making predictions thing, right? We, we knew what it did, so we predicted what must be there. Uh, to the question in the chat about having to learn the different types, uh, no, I'm not, I'm, that's not a focus of mine in our class. There are, uh, like Audrey mentioned, there are six different types of synovial joints. I'm not gonna spend our semester time learning them. So if you're interested, feel free. I always tell students, Google is your friend, so feel free to Google the types of synovial joints. All I want you to know, big picture, all six types have synovial fluid. The bones are, are always separated from each other by a fluid-filled space. So that's the extent of, of what we're doing. There is one other type of joint that is covered in your guided lesson. And this is a type of joint that is, is near and dear to my heart as someone who had a baby eight months ago. Uh, and this is a type of joint called a fontanelle. Fontanelle. This is my last kind of joint that, that we're talking about. When we talk about a fontanelle, what are some of the things you all remember reading about it? What did we read about those fontanelles? Uh, where do we find them? Um, what did they do? What's going on with a fontanelle? Perfect, lots of great ideas here. So uh, let's start with our anatomy. We absolutely find these on the top of a baby's head. We do also have some on the side of their head. The, the emphasis here is we're talking fetal and baby skull. That's the big thing with them. Found them in the, the fetal and the baby skull. With these fontanelles, they make the skull more flexible. So skull is more flexible, meaning the bones of the skull move a little bit more. One of the ways that they move is they move together during the process of childbirth. So a couple of us mentioned childbirth. That's why uh, I was appreciative of fontanelles when I recently had my son. So uh, fontanelles make the, the, so the skull's more flexible. Uh, this means that the skull squeezes together, squeezes down in childbirth. So makes the process of childbirth easier by squeezing the bones together. But the other thing that, that the fontanelles allow as well, which several of us mentioned too, is that this allows the skull to expand. Skull expands 
with bone growth by having a flexible layer. Um, so when we talk about fontanelles, there's no bone overlap, just proteins. I've got this place where there's just stringy, stringy, stringy proteins inside of here. That's going to allow this place to compress in during childbirth, but also to expand out as a baby is growing. So I have a skull uh, in, in a developing child up until about age two, like one of us mentioned in, in the chat. My, the skull in, in a baby uh, is much more flexible than the skull in an adult. And it, it comes down to the fact that I have fontanelles in the fetal skull, but like someone mentioned, these turn into sutures in the adult skull. So I'll add a note for us here, turn into sutures, turn into sutures. You can actually see on an x-ray or on a, a tissue scan, you can see a fontanelle. It looks different than uh, a suture would. So sutures seen in the adult skull, fontanelles seen in a, a child skull, in a baby skull. Anatomy and physiology. We've got three kinds of joints that are shaped differently or they're made out of different stuff, which allows those three kinds of joints to do very different things, anatomy and physiology. That was our example with the joints. We also said we wanted to talk about the types of blood vessels. So blood vessels is a topic that you will spend more time on when you get to AMP2, talking about the types of blood vessels. In our class, Primarily, we are, are going to talk about them as an example of anatomy and physiology. Over here on the left, I'm looking at a type of blood vessel that is called a continuous capillary. A continuous capillary. And when we think about this type of blood vessel, it gets its name, this continuous thing, based on its anatomy. So the anatomy of a continuous capillary, the first thing that you'd notice with these blood vessels is that all of these little cells that are in the very middle of the blood vessel, these cells are all complete and they're sealed. They're right next to each other. So in a continuous capillary, we have a continuous layer of cells. There's no holes in this layer of cells in the very middle of the blood vessel. And then we look one layer out around those cells in the blood vessel where I have connective tissue. You can see it here in blue. This connective tissue layer is also complete. There's no holes in this layer either. So I've got a continuous layer of connective tissue. When we talk about a continuous capillary, the most important thing for you to know about it is it has no holes, there's no spaces. Compare that to the type of blood vessel we see over here. This type of blood vessel that we see over here is called a sinusoid, sinusoid. When we talk about a sinusoid, it is not no holes. Instead, a sinusoid is like holes everywhere. So notice my layer of cells in the middle of the blood vessel. Not only is there spaces in between these cells, but some of those cells even have holes inside of them. Lots of holes. And then we look at that connective tissue that's around those cells. And again, all kinds of holes all over the place. I have in a sinusoid so many holes, so many everywhere. My anatomy is, is basically opposite when we talk about a sinusoid compared to a continuous capillary, which should trigger in your mind that their physiologies are going to be really different too. When we think about a type of blood vessel that has a ton of holes in it, what might something that has a bunch of holes in it be good at doing for us? 
what might I use something with holes, a blood vessel that has holes to do? Yeah, so when, when we think about a blood vessel with holes, think about this a lot like um, a strainer that you have in your kitchen. A sinusoid is what we use in the body to filter blood. When we talk about filtering blood, um, we, we saw a note in, in the chat, totally right. This is where we would get rid of old red blood cells. They could leave through these holes if they're old and worn out, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to recycle it and use it to build a new cell. This is also the kind of blood vessel, too, that I could use to get rid of bacteria or viruses to pull things out that, that shouldn't be in my bloodstream. The benefit of having sinusoids in your body is sometimes there are things inside my blood that I don't want there whether it's an old red blood cell that I need to recycle or whether it's something that would make me sick. I need to have spaces for it to leave my bloodstream so I can deal with it outside of my bloodstream. That's the benefit of sinusoids. Continuous capillaries, remember, are kind of the opposite of, of a sinusoid. So their job is going to kind of be opposite as well. When we talk about a continuous capillary, this is not um, specifically going to be a type of blood vessel I use to filter things in the sense of like pulling things out of my bloodstream. This is the kind of blood vessel you could kind of think about as protecting me. Protecting me in the sense that if there's something bad in my bloodstream, this kind of blood vessel is not gonna let it out. So when we talk about a continuous capillary, this is gonna be a type of blood vessel that has no leaking, no leaking. Sinusoids, these are my ones that leak, my leaky blood vessels. But when we talk about a continuous capillary, there's no leaking. Now, we've talked about what's there, the anatomy, We've talked a little bit about the physiology in terms of no leaking versus leaking. We can also think of the anatomy in the sense of where we find these blood vessels, if we're keeping in mind whether or not they leak. For my types of blood vessels that don't leak, I find them in places in my body where we absolutely don't want bacteria or viruses to come out. Places that we might call immunoprivileged, meaning the immune system might not be as active there as other places. Laura's totally right. A couple of those places, the biggest one that I wanna emphasize with you is the brain. The type of blood vessels that we have pretty much everywhere in the brain are continuous capillaries. There's no holes, so there's no leaking. We're also gonna find it in places like the lungs, where we don't want bacteria and viruses chilling out. That's, that's bad news for us. Sinusoids are gonna be found in organs of the body that their job is to pull out junk, to pull out stuff that's not supposed to be there. Yeah, absolutely, a couple of us in the chat are mentioning some of those places. One of those places is that organ that, that we tried really hard yesterday to find, right? The spleen that's found back behind the stomach. Another organ that's going to have, have sinusoids is going to be the liver. So organs in the body that their job is, is to pull out the junk, we're going to have these sinusoids there so that we can pull out the old red blood cells or pull out bacteria and, and viruses. That's what we do with sinusoids in places where we want to keep stuff in and only let out uh, the important stuff. So for example, oxygen, or um, we'll talk about next chapter, how a cell's favorite food is called glucose. That's the kind of stuff that can get in and out of a continuous capillary, but most other things can't. So keep in mind, places we want to keep safe, we're going to have a continuous capillary, Places that have a job of filtering things, 
we're going to use sinusoids there. How do we feel about blood vessels? Thumbs up? Or what questions do we still have? Um, question about the amount of clotting in a sinusoid. Um, that, that's a good question. I, I don't know for sure. The, the one thing I'll mention about clotting is a lot of times that's not happening um, in the blood vessel itself, or it's not supposed to happen in the blood vessel. It usually happens just outside of the blood vessel. Because um, if we get a clot inside a blood vessel, then we stop having blood passing through it. Um, so you're usually going to see blood clots just outside of a blood vessel, making you a, bleed, a, a bruise when something's bleeding. Um, that, that's a great question. I, I'm not certain if we would form more or fewer blood clots outside of a sinusoid. They're certainly leakier. Um, so theoretically, that might mean they could make some more blood clots. Um, but I apologize, I don't have a straight answer on that one. That's it is an interesting question. Good question. I will say too, though, in places like the spleen, we don't want to rupture our spleen because that's where platelets come from. <laughs> so if you rupture your spleen, you're going to have all kinds of blood clotting problems. So uh, maybe we don't want those sinusoids doing blood clots for us because <laughs> they're, they're in the organ that does all the clotting. <laughs> All right, uh, I know we had some requests as well to talk about our, um, about our types of cells, our fat cells. Let me jump to that. Uh, let me do an informal poll. In my chat, give me a thumbs up if you've read this article a thumbs down if you haven't read it yet, if we're still working on it. If you have read the brown fat, white fat article, give me a thumbs up. No shame if you got to give me a thumbs down because we haven't read it yet. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we got a great mix. So we're, we're maybe 50-50. Maybe a few more of us have read it than haven't. Totally fine. We're still, remember, these assignments aren't due un until Sunday. So you still got plenty of time to read it. Oh. Jasmine's got the crying cat. That's okay, Jasmine. It's okay that you haven't read it yet. <laughs> the article talks to you about the two kinds of fat cells that, that we have in the body. So we're looking at, at a, um, a sketch that kind of represents one type over here. We've got another type over here. Um, so for my friends who have had a chance to read my article, um, when I'm looking at this, well, here, let's, let's take a step back here. When we talk about fat cells, we have a special science name for fat cells. So my special science name for fat cells, they're called adipocytes. Adipocytes, that's a fat cell. Adipocytes. So you're going to see this word come back up when we start doing tissues in lab. Adipocytes are the cells that I find in adipose connective tissue. That's one of the types of tissue that we're going to look at, adipose connective tissue. So the special cells found in fat are called adipocytes. Now when you're squeezing your fat in the mirror, right, you know what kind of cell to be yelling at, those stupid adipocytes, right? So adipocytes come in two varieties. We have what are called white adipocytes or white fat cells, white fat cells. And we have what are called brown fat cells, brown adipocytes. <laughs> Kaylin said, how do you know that I think that? Oh, it, everyone thinks that, Kaylin. You're not alone. But now we're going to start calling them adipocytes, right? <laughs> so brown fat and white fat, white adipocytes, brown adipocytes. I think we, we already started mentioning this in, in the chat here, but let's help each other out for sure. This cell that I'm looking at right here, is this one a, a brown fat cell or a white fat cell? 
Can we tell from our, our cartoon over here? Yeah, so lots of us are chiming in. This one that I'm looking at right here, this is a white fat cell or a white adipocyte. We'll put that word up there too so we remember, white adipocyte. Which means that this one over here, I guess I'll add my label too, this one over here is my brown adipocyte or my brown fat cell. Brown fat cell adipocyte. Here's my question for you then. Um, we all, or most of us here, identified this one as a white fat cell. This one as brown fat cell. Can you give me some ideas in the chat? How did we figure that out? What were some of the clues that you used to help you identify either of these kinds? I want some clues about both of them. How could you tell one which one was white? How could you tell which one was brown? What were, were some of the things we used? Okay. Yeah, so I'm getting some comments here about this big thing right here. This big thing right here, it looks kind of white, right? So this, this big white space here is, is actually a lipid droplet, and it looks white. Perfect. Um, yeah, so some of us are talking about the fact that, well, hey, these little things in here, these little brown spots, they're in a brown fat cell. So these brown spots that we see here are an organelle that, that we're going to talk about in uh, next week's lab called the mitochondria. Mitochondria. Mitochondria look brown. I like someone mentioned they look like brown beans. I love it. I had chili for dinner last night, so these are looking like little chili beans here. Let's be real. <laughs> we, we got some brown chili beans going on. That makes this a brown fat cell. We've got this big white dot in this one, making it, it a white fat cell. This is perfect. We are talking about some of the things that are the anatomy of these cells. So let's list some of the important anatomies uh, of white fat cells. Somebody mentioned in the chat for me, a white fat cell has one big lipid droplet. One big lipid droplet. This whole thing is a big storage center for, for adipose or for lipids. Now, for a, a white fat cell, it's got this big storage chamber where I've got tons and tons of lipids. I know that fat cells, they, they have a bad reputation. We like to dog on them because we're, we're not a fan. But when we think about a adipocyte, specifically a white adipocyte, this whole area is filled with lipids. Does anyone remember from your reading, why do we store lipids? Why, why would our body keep lipids around? Do we remember reading that? Why we might hold on to lipids? Yeah, exactly. So, so big picture in your body, lipids are an energy source. Lipids are an energy source. Now, to be fair, using lipids for energy is really hard. Um, lipids are really hard to break down, but they also have a ton of energy stored in them. What's way easier for your body to break down to make energy from is carbs. We're gonna talk about next lesson how your cells love a carb called glucose. That's their favorite thing to break down. It's the easiest to use. They love it. Lipids store a lot of energy. When I, when I look at a, a white fat cell here, all of this is energy that can be broken down. But it's really hard to do lipid metabolism. So your body doesn't do it automatically. It's much more likely to burn stuff that's easier to burn. That being said, sometimes, especially at the very stressful points of the semester, right? We've probably all been known to have a few extra carbs or a few extra sugars, right? That sugar gets into our bloodstream. Our body doesn't need it all. Now it's got all this extra energy floating around. Lipids are also a really good way to store 
energy. So lipids are great for energy storage. Lipids are great for energy storage. So I've got this huge uh, bubble. Uh, it's technically called a, a vacuole, I believe. Um, maybe, I might be wrong on that. But I've got this big droplet filled with lipids. All of this is stored energy. I had extra carbs, I had extra sugar. I'm storing it inside the cell for later. I can use it later. So when you think about a white fat cell, white fat cells function number one, they, they store energy. So we're storing energy inside a, a white fat cell. I know I saw a couple other ideas too though about what I use white fat cells for. Uh, white fat cells, um, totally right, that they, they function uh, in, in helping you to stay warm as well. They help you to stay warm. They're forming kind of an insulating cushion around your organs, around your body as a whole. So white fat cells, because they have this big lipid droplet inside of them, they're really good at storing energy. They're really good at keeping you warm. Lipid, this huge lipid droplet, makes these cells look white. When you look at a white fat cell, all you'll see inside of it, one big fat droplet. When you look at a brown fat cell, you're going to see lots of smaller lipid droplets. See these little small lipid droplets here. But like we mentioned before, small lipid droplet, add that. The other thing that you see, and the thing that actually makes them brown, are the mitochondria. Lots of mitochondria. So all of these little brown organelles that I see right here are my mitochondria. I bet your high school science teacher helped you memorize what mitochondria do. What do mitochondria do? What did we learn in high school to call them? <laughs> Yep, there it is. Our, our high school science is, is coming back to help us out, right? In high school, we learned the mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell. Um, in, in college anatomy, we're going to uh, we're gonna say what it does a little bit differently. In college anatomy, we're going to say that the mitochondria is what we use to build energy but we have a special name for the kind of energy that cells like to use. Does anyone happen to know the name of the chemical energy of cells? Yeah, so the, the chemical energy that our cells really like, um, later I'm gonna call it the energy money of a cell, it's called ATP. Let me type that for us here. ATP, the energy money of a cell. When you think about the mitochondria, their job is to build ATP. Their job is to build energy money, if you will. So when we think about a brown fat cell, it's full of mitochondria. Mitochondria can take things like sugar, can take things like lipids, and they can turn them into ATP. And ATP is the kind of, of energy that your cell uses to do things. So when we talk about a brown fat cell or a brown adipocyte, this is a cell that has a whole bunch of mitochondria. What does that tell me about that cell, about its physiology? If a cell has a lot of mitochondria, what is it doing? Yeah, I, I love Tian's answer there. Absolutely. This, this type of cell is going to be, it's, it's going to be burning fat or burning those lipids because it's using those lipids to build ATP. In a brown fat cell, you're only going to see these little small lipid droplets here because we're constantly pulling the lipids that are inside of them out of the droplet to go to mitochondria so that the mitochondria can burn that lipid to make ATP. 
So the lipid droplets in here are much smaller, which makes them much easier for the mitochondria to use to make energy from. And as the mitochondria uses those lipids to make ATP, it also makes something else. And this something else that, that gets made is, is more uh, hints at the overall function of brown fat. When you were reading about brown fat, what was kind of the, the reason they said that brown fat was good? For things like babies or hibernating animals? What does brown fat do for us besides make ATP? Does anyone remember? Yeah, so there we go. I'm going to jump on. I've got a couple of us here chiming in. It's not so much that brown fat will insulate us as much as it's actually going to generate heat. We're actually going to build heat when we go through. That's why this word burning fat is, is really applicable here. You actually make heat when you break down lipids. So brown fat literally generates heat for you. White fat insulates you. It keeps your heat in. But brown fat is going to make you warmer. When babies are born, most of their adipose tissue is actually brown fat. It helps them to stay warm. The older we get, the more white fat we develop. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the article yet, the article comparing white fat to brown fat talks about some ways for you to increase the number of brown fat cells that you have. That's kind of like the life goal, right? Increase brown fat so we can burn our, our lipids that are in the body. And hey, it'll keep us warmer in, in the process. So our last example from lesson number one of, of how anatomy and physiology are related to each other. White fat, my white adipocytes, compared to brown fat, my brown adipocytes. They look different. I can see that from their little cartoon and they function very different as well. And you'll read some more details about how they're different from each other. Um, all of, of the content that's in that article will help you as you're completing the specific assignment for this, this article. The article about brown fat and white fat has its own homework assignment separate from the homework assignment for lesson number one. So please make sure we complete both of those assignments by Sunday night. I have covered about all I was planning to cover today. I want to open up the chat for questions, for comments, for emojis. What are we thinking and feeling? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to use my mic just because it's easier for me than typing it all out. Yeah, go for it. That's um, totally fine. So on the checklist, on the lab part, it says that you need to complete all the Blackboard assignments. Are those just these two assignments that it's talking about? So these things that we talked about today are the lecture assignments. Okay. Um, let me go ahead here. I'll pull up my, um, my Blackboard site. Let me find Blackboard, and I, I will show you all what all we have going on this week. Let me get my screen right here. All right, so there, there's two sets of homework that we have to do each week. Um, the first set of homework that you should should start on now is stuff related to lab because there's lab stuff due on Friday. So I'm going to go in here into lab resources. If you have not already, you need to start here to enroll in our visible body class section. So if you haven't already, make sure to click on this link and click on the enroll here for for visible body. 
once you've done that, you're good to go down here to weeks one through six. So I'm gonna go into weeks one through six. And right now, here we are in week one. So in week one, what I need to do is I need to, by Friday, complete the two assignments, Invisible Body. And by Sunday, I need to complete these two Blackboard assignments related to lab. So there's a link here. Again, we're in, in the lab folder for the week. There's a link to take you to Visible Body to do those two Visible Body assignments. And then notice right underneath are my two lesson number one assignments for Blackboard. So these are what's due in lab by Sunday. This is just the lab stuff. So three things for us to click on for, for lab this week. This one's due Friday, visible body stuff. These ones are due Sunday. That's the stuff we covered in class yesterday. Today's stuff is actually here in lecture resources. In lecture resources, I'm gonna go here to unit number one. We worked on lesson number one today, but everything in this first folder that you see here, all of this is due by Sunday. So the first assignment is right here. So lesson number one, anatomy versus physiology. That's the homework assignment that is, is due for lecture, the first one that's due for lecture by Sunday. The other one that's due by Sunday for lecture is lesson number one, brown fat and white fat. So this assignment is based on that article. Once you've read that article and filled in those sets of questions, you should be ready to complete this assignment. The one other thing that we need to make sure that, that we complete by Sunday night is your first group assignment. Remember, uh, I told you when we're, we click on this here, it will redirect you to the groups area of our site. For this week, what we have due is a lecture group wiki, so find your unit number one group, or you can just click on it over here. Find your unit number one group, and answer that first wiki. Our lab project technically not due until next week. So if you wanna wait a little bit, do that one later, that's totally fine. Um, but your, your group assignment also due, like it mentions here, by Sunday night. Go back to my, um, the chat, uh, to the question about the workload. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. This week is pretty light compared to future weeks. So if you're done early, I would say go ahead and start moving on. Um, you can get everything from unit number one done. It's all available for you. You don't need to work ahead, but this week is probably lighter compared to other weeks. Um, question about study tips. Uh, my recommendation for you would be to go through and complete your, your lesson outline once using the guided lesson. And then what I would recommend you do is go back and kind of summarize the information on that outline. The more you can practice putting stuff in your own words as opposed to memorizing exactly what you see on that outline, the more likely you are to understand to help you know whether you're understanding stuff, and this is for lecture or for lab, each of these assignments that we complete, either here or in Visible Body, you get multiple attempts on them. So I would recommend, even if you get a 100% the first time you do it, you should probably do the assignments at least two or three times, just to give you that practice, to help you prepare, um, to make sure you really understand. So my first study tip, put things in your own words. My second study tip, do with these assignments as many times as you can, because the more times you do it, the more practice you have. Practice makes perfect, or maybe a better way to think about it um, in our semester is 
practice makes you actually remember because that's the worst, right? When you get to a test and your mind goes blank. So practice, practice, practice. Use those, those unlimited attempts to, to really learn things. Uh, there is a, a question in the chat about the outlines. It's a great question. Um, so we're filling in outlines for, for lecture. We are filling in those worksheets for lab. I do not collect those. Those are, you're creating yourself a study guide. So you filling those in is going to help you prepare for assignments and prepare for the exams. I don't collect them. You fill them in to help you answer the questions on the homework assignment. So there's nowhere that you upload those. Those are, are for you, for your reference. So don't worry about scanning them. Don't worry about doing anything in a PDF format. That's, that's for your reference. Uh, question about current events. Current events is used once uh, or is done once a unit. Um, so you only have to complete that assignment one time between now and the first exam. Remember, we did talk about how um, you can do it twice each unit to get some extra credit. So you only have to submit stuff, though, um, one time before the exam. So it's not every week that we're doing current events. Now that we've talked a little bit about anatomy and physiology and we've talked about some of those organs, you could go in and complete it now. I would recommend maybe waiting a lesson or two just so you have more specific facts to pull on to help you understand your articles. Um, but that first set of current events in anatomy is not due until the Sunday before the test. Um, I love that Dennis thinks the homework assignments are fun. That's awesome. Love it. Um, Audrey, were you, okay, so you, you typed it down below. Um, yeah, so to Audrey's question about the group wiki, you are answering both questions, but one part of both questions. Let me see if it will pull up for me. Let me leave student preview to show you. Audrey's a ahead of the curve. So she's looking at, at the group wiki for lab. I'll just point it out so we, we are aware when we start working on that wiki. When you click on your, your lab project group, and you'll just have one group, your group's page will, will load up. I'm going to scroll down on this page. Underneath the name of the group members, I see right here a thing that says group wiki. So I click on group wiki, and that's going to take me to the place where I'm actually going to put information. Hey, look at that. Morgan has started. Is Morgan here today? Shout out to Morgan. Um, when you're ready to answer questions, you'll click here on your edit wiki content to answer the questions. There are two questions, so two topics. You are picking for the first topic one of the organelles listed. So Morgan picked the nucleus. You could pick the ribosomes, the plasma membrane, the mitochondria. You'll answer both of these questions about the one organelle that you pick. Then you'll scroll down to the second topic. For the second, second topic, topic, one set of two structures. So maybe you pick the ocular lens and the low power objective. Morgan picks the coarse and fine adjustment knobs. You'll answer all of those questions related to the set of structures that you're doing. So for those of you planning to work on your lab wiki right now, no pressure because it's not due till next Sunday. But if you're going to work on it, you just have to answer uh, one organelle and one set of microscope parts. You're answering a total of four things because each, each one has two parts. Um, so Kaylin, did you see what I was talking about when we went into this one? Let me back up one. Here, I'll go to a lecture group. Show you what the lecture one is because that's the assignment that's actually to do this Sunday is a lecture group. So I'm going to go into unit number one. This is where you'll find your lecture wiki. The lecture wiki is the one that is due 
by Sunday. Go right here to my group wiki. So see how I've got the directions or the group description up here, down below in the group tools area, group wiki. When I click on the group wiki, again, this page looks very similar to what we saw before. When I'm ready, I'll click on edit wiki content. And the good news is this first wiki assignment that's due on Sunday, super easy. All you gotta do is tell me why you're taking anatomy and physiology. And I want you to tell me what you think, or what, you, what experience you have with an online course, and what do you think you're gonna need to do to succeed in an online course. So no anatomy work that you have to do for this first wiki. This is just to make sure we figure out how to do that. Okay, perfect. So Kaylin's tracking with me now too, excellent. Let me go back to my questions. Uh, yeah, so there was a question about um, practicing for the tests. Let me go into, oops, wrong page. Let me show you, you can't repeat the same assignments to help you prepare for the tests. Um, what I may not have uploaded yet, bear with me, this looks a little different than yours. You all don't have unit two and three yet. What's going to happen, let's go to the student view. Uh, very soon, I will make sure to pull for you a review assignment that pulls questions from each of, of these lessons. So you won't be redoing, redoing lesson, lesson number one assignment to practice, but I will have a review assignment that's gonna show up at the very bottom down here. So it's not there yet, I will try to get that pulled. I'm gonna make a note for that right now um, to get your review assignment, assignment up for you ASAP. Um, but that will also be just like the other homework assignments, that will also be graded. You need to complete it because that's gonna help you the most with, with preparing for the exams is doing those review assignments. So once we finish an assignment, you can't do it again later, but you do have that review assignment that's gonna be coming at the end of the unit to help you prepare. Any other last minute questions before we call it a day? How do we feel uh, in general about lesson number one? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What are we thinking? Got the inquisitive look. <laughs> um, Audrey asked about my kids. I have a, a daughter named Evelyn and a son named Ethan. So boy and a girl. Uh, yes, I missed that question before. Can you do the same organelle as another group member? The answer to that question is no. So if somebody already went in and did the plasma membrane, you got to pick something else, um, which might be a reason if there's a particular organelle you really want to make sure you're doing on the assignment go ahead and and jump on there now and and do it so any question uh that is a content question so the lab wiki has content questions any question that another group member already answered you cannot answer again you're you're answering different microscope parts or you're answering different organelles it's going to be the same way for our our unit number one review wiki if somebody already answered a question, you can't answer it again, you gotta answer a different one. So uh, hop on that if you saw one that you're particularly interested in. All right, well, we are done with our class today. We do not have a class scheduled for tomorrow. I will be having student hours tomorrow from one to 2.30 meaning I'm gonna chill out here in our virtual classroom. If you have questions that you want to either type or talk with me about, I will be here. I would love to, to chat with you. Uh, so that's tomorrow from one to 2.30. The next time we will have class together will be next Wednesday. So next Wednesday at one o'clock, we will cover week two lab stuff. I will get you a schedule for uh, our class sessions posted, again, ASAP. Um, 
so be watching for that. But it's going to be the week two lab stuff, which is about regional terms and cells and microscopes. Uh, that'll be Wednesday at one o'clock. And then we'll do lesson number two on Thursday at, at one o'clock. So I'm going to pause our recording. I'll stick around a bit for any last minute questions that you have. Otherwise, I hope to maybe see you tomorrow with any questions that you have, or I will see you back next week. Question before I head out. Uh -huh. um, your 